Contested Bones, Part 16. We've been looking at the book Contested Bones by Christopher Roop and John Sanford, published just this last year. Uh, the website uh, gives a little more information, including, um, well, there's the, there's the uh, front page, uh, the cover of the book and including pictures of Christopher Roop and John Sanford. To review where we've gotten so far, in the prologue, John Sanford believed in evolution until around the age of 50 when he realized the impotence of evolution and the impact of what could be called genetic entropy or devolution. And then, having decided that meant that evolution was wrong and probably creationism was right because you shorten the time frame without a miracle. And uh, then he had cognitive dissonance with supposedly all the fossil evidence of man evolving from apes. And so he and one of his protégés, Christopher Roop, set about to investigate. Chapter one discusses kind of background material, the advancing apes icon, the evolutionary story, scientific method, and taxonomic principles. Chapter two continues um, the introduction, the textbook picture following Darwin's expectation is straight line evolution. The field is widely acknowledged not to be straight line, rather bush-like, and there are some that state that this, the ascent of man cannot presently be traced and may never be traced. These are evolutionists. Almost all the fossils are contested. In chapter three, they make the case that Neanderthals are human. In chapter four, that Homo erectus is human. In chapter five, that Homo floresiensis, or the hobbit, is human. In chapter six, that Australopithecus afarensis is an ape. The human-like parts are the parts that are missing. In chapter seven, Ardipithecus ramidus is an ape. Again, the human-like parts are the parts that are missing, and of interest, they're different parts. Chapter eight, Homo habilis is a mixture of ape and human. It's not really a single animal. Chapter nine, the same thing is true for Australopithecus sediba. And in chapter 10, Homo naledi is human, just degenerative, somewhat like uh, Homo floresiensis. In chapter seven, they document that modern humans lived alongside of apes going all the way back to now 5.7 million years ago by conventional dating. In chapter 12, they take up conventional dating and show that it's flawed. Potassium argon and argon dating have trouble identifying recent lava, as does uranium thorium dating, although that would be recent speleothem in that case. And carbon-14 dating argues for a young age for life on Earth. And it finishes with a classic case showing that even when dating methods agree, that doesn't mean that they can't be changed. And now we're into chapter 13, genetic evidence validation of the ape to man story. And the quote in the beginning is if evolution is right, then, pardon me, if ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. Of course, the quote was meant to disparage ENCODE but the reverse logic also applies. If ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. And the first part of our chapter we covered last week, and it starts, does genetic evidence prove what the fossil record has failed to show? And the first part of the chapter is actually problems with evolution rather than problems with creation. There are four profound genetic problems with ape to man evolution. And uh, these are my own words. The changes needed are more complex than usually thought. The needed mutations are rarer than usually thought. The needed mutations get lost more easily by genetic drift than usually thought. 
and the combination of that is they don't happen very well fast. And finally, in the meantime, deleterious mutations are piling up because there are too many of them and selection is often too weak to get rid of them. And that's the nuts, the central core of genetic entropy, which of course is the particular specialty of John Sanford. But now we're getting into refuting genetic evidences claim to prove ape to man evolution. We've just reviewed four profound genetic problems that make ape to man evolution essentially impossible. However, some will still argue that there are powerful genetic evidences that conclusively prove ape to man evolution. These are discussed below. Number one, ch human and chimp DNA similarity. Physical and genetic similarities can be explained in terms of either a common ancestor or by a common designer. So physical and genetic similarities between ape and human are not by themselves compelling evidence for common ancestry. Furthermore, the genetic similarities between ape and man are much less than the 98% similarity that is commonly cited, and sometimes even 99%. For example, primate evolutionist Todd Pruse states in a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, it is now clear that the genetic differences between humans and chimpanzees are far more extensive than previously thought. Their genomes are not 98 or 99 percent identical. The latest analyses indicate that the genetic similarity between chimps and man is more like 90 percent. In other words, the genomes are 10 percent different. Even if the genetic differences were just 1%, which is false, this would still be 30 million genetic letter differences. Regardless of the degree of genetic similarity between man and ape, mere similarity is a very weak argument for common ancestry. Now, shared mutational mistakes, this is really the core it is commonly argued that while similarity is not proof of ape to man common ancestry, shared mistakes provide a powerful argument for common descent. At the heart of this argument is the idea that apes and men share the same junk DNA and so have similar genetic fossils, have similar genetic mistakes. However, if these shared genomic regions are not really junk DNA, then the entire shared mistakes argument falls apart because then they could be common design. The powerful new ENCODE evidence very seriously undermines the shared mistakes argument because most of what was previously thought to be junk in our genome is now shown to be functional and essential to life. ENCODE is an ongoing massive international consortium of scientists. ENCODE has showed that most of the human, a gen human genome is functional, not junk, and so most shared mistakes are not actually mistakes at all, but are shared functions. Shared functions support the idea of similarity by design. In the words of one prominent evolutionist, if ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. In this light, all the shared mistakes arguments appear to be collapsing. In the past, it was claimed that junk DNA arose as a result of a long history of accumulating genetic damage and the relentless invasion and amplification of selfish genes. Our previous work has shown that the genome is indeed subject to many degenerative processes and it is the very, this is very problematic for evolution because it causes evolution to go the wrong way. This degeneration problem also limits the time available for evolution of new traits because all populations must be moving towards extinction. See above. In spite of the fact that ENCODE has already largely falsified the junk DNA paradigm, some people continue to advance the argument that the junk DNA found in both the chimp and human genomes proves human evolution. The most commonly used shared mistakes arguments have involved two types of junk DNA, pseudogenes and dispersed repeats. We will briefly examine a few of the more famous arguments. One, beta pseudoglobin pardon me, beta globin pseudogene. Some of you may remember this from way back when. 
The beta globin cytogene was used very prominently as evidence for human evolution in the famous Kitzmiller versus Dover court case in 2005. And before that, I think in Spectrum to argue to Adventists that, um, that we needed to give up uh, on evolution. Uh, that we needed to give up and accept it. Um, Kenneth Miller, a Brown University biology professor, pre presented key evidence to support the belief that humans evolved from a chimp-like ancestor. Exhibit A was a hemoglobin protein found in red blood cells that transports oxygen throughout the body's circulatory system. The hemoglobin protein is made up of alpha and beta subprotein structures. Put most simply, there are six genes which encode the beta globin protein structure. Until recently, it has been claimed by evolutionists that five of the six genes code for functional proteins. While the sixth gene, known as HBBP1, has been thought to be a broken gene that had lost its function. It did not appear to be functional because it could not code for a protein, but could only make RNA. The HBBP1 pseudogene was found to be, have matching nucleotides in humans and apes in the positions that were assumed to be where the gene was broken. Advocates of ape-to-man evolution use these presumed shared mutational mistakes as proof of common ancestry. They argue that there is no way the identical random mutations could arise in the same positions independently in three separate species chimps, humans, and gorillas, the best explanation seemed to be that all three evolved from a common ancestor. A decade has passed since the Dover trial. Geneticists now know that the evidence presented by Miller has been overwhelmingly refuted. It is categorically false to say that HP, HBBP1 is a broken, non-functional pseudogene that proves common ancestry. Multiple lines of evidence published in leading evolution-based journals have clearly revealed that this beta-globin RNA gene is actively transcribed, is highly functional, and is essential to maintaining health. Three separate scientific publications in human genetics and in hemoglobin have shown that this gene is essential and when the HBBP1 pseudogene is mutated, it results in the human blood disease known as beta thalassemia. Interesting. A number of additional studies in the journals Genome Biology and Evolution, Cell, Genome Research, Genes and Development, Nature, and more, have shown that HBBP1 is more active than any of the other five genes in the beta globin cluster. The HBBP1 beta globin pseudogene encodes multiple regulatory RNA transcripts that are crucial during the development and are expressed in at least 251 different human cells and tissue types. Evolutionary geneticists discovered through comparative analysis of the HBBP1 pseudogene that it was far more conserved than the other functional genes in the beta protein cluster. Conserved is a genetics term. When a gene is cons uh, conserved, it means it is the same in a very wide range of organisms, indicating a widely shared function. Such conservation confirms the gene is not useless junk, but is vital. These research published, researchers published their re results in PLOS Journal of Computational Biology. They report an analyses based on classic neutrality tests, empirical and haplotype-based studies, revealed that HDB and its neighbor pseudogene HBBP1 have mainly evolved under purifying selection, suggesting that their roles are es essential and non-redundant. It is ironic that the most famous example of a shared mistake, now you know why you heard about it, actually involves a shared functional essential gene sequence. The Dover trial was a serious miscarriage of justice. The new data reveals a highly functional and very sophisticated multipurpose gene that is shared in ape and man, providing strong evidence for shared design. And the interesting thing of it is nobody's gonna go back to that uh, that trial and put a footnote and change the results.
B, vitamin C pseudogene. Vitamin C, also known as ascorbic acid, is essential for our health. And this may sound familiar to some of you who've been in this class for a while. Uh, many animals are able to synthesize their own vitamin C, but humans, apes, guinea pigs, bats, and many bird species are unable to synthesize vitamin C and must get it from their diet, that is, fruits and vegetables. Some have assumed that since both man and apes lack this function, this is a shared defect inherited from a distant primate ancestor. Advocates of ape to man evolution have said that people and apes have exactly the same broken gene and that this broken gene once enabled vitamin C biosynthesis. They are referring to the functional GULO gene found in rats, mice, etc., which enables vitamin C synthesis and is somewhat similar pseudogene found in humans and apes, not enabling vitamin C synthesis. The human and ape GULO gene is very different from the GULO gene found in rats. It has a few of the characteristics of a normal vitamin C gene, but does not enable vitamin C synthesis. A key question is this, is it correct to assume that the human ape gene once had the same function as the very different rat GULO gene and is and so is now a dead gene, hence representing a shared mistake. In most animals that make their own vitamin C, there are four genes required. The first three genes perform additional, unrelated functions, but they also synthesize the precursor of vitamin C. The fourth gene, called the GULO gene, converts that precursor into vitamin C. Humans and apes also have the first three genes, which are fully operational and essential. However, where the last gene should be, apes and humans have another gene that is only slightly similar to the GULO gene. This last gene does not make a protein and so is assumed to be an ancient broken gene, otherwise known as junk DNA. Although it is very different from the GULO genes that make vitamin C, it is still called the GULO gene. In humans and apes, the GULO gene is said to show evidence of various genetic mistakes such as deleted sequences, premature stop codons, and other alleged inactivation mutations. These mistakes are simply inferences based on the assumption that originally this gene was able to synthesize vitamin C and so must have been nearly identical to the GULO genes of rats, but is not anymore. Gibbons, orangutans, chimpanzees, and macaques all seem to share the same presumed mutations. To explain this, it is assumed that in all primates, the genes shared features represent shared mistakes, which would seem to point to common ancestry. According to this hypothesis, the ape GULO sequence was formerly a functional gene that was disabled in a very early primate lineage and was eventually passed down to humans and apes. We propose an alternative hypothesis. We propose that the human gene is not and never was the same as the GULO gene and has always had a different function. That function has not yet been discovered, as is true with most pseudogenes, but in an increasingly smaller my majority. By, in 1988, a study conducted by Nikishima, pardon me, Nishikimi, boy, and colleagues used the functional rat GULA gene and hybridized it with an unknown DNA sequence in humans. Now, notice this is way before you had easily sequenced genes. And so they're using hybridization back then. They reported that the alignable sequence regions were only 75% similar, whereas pseudogenes are typically around 90% similar. So it didn't really look quite like a pseudogene. What is more problematic is that the alignable region consisted of only a tiny fraction of the entire rat GULO sequence. Out of the total 2,120 bases compared, only 158 bases in the reputed human GULO sequence were alignable with the rat GULO gene. Accounting for the vast non-alignable regions, that is most of the uh, gene sequence, the actual uh, genetic similarity amounted to a mere 13.4 percent. The 75 percent in the areas that could kind of sort of match 13.4% total, not much similarity. To explain this discrepancy, Nishikimi 
and colleagues speculated that the human GULO pseudogene was so different because it rapidly accumulated mutations under no selective pressure. Even while the non-alignable regions were being deleted without leaving any evidence. This, uh, another mutation that didn't get corrected, uh, ad hoc hypothesis is not testable. We argue that a more reasonable interpretation for why the rat and human genes are so different is simply because they are, and always have been, sequences with different functions. Since that first study in 1988, genome sequencing technologies have greatly improved. Scientists now have the ability to sequence large portions of DNA with a greater degree of accuracy and efficiency. With these advancements, more re recent studies have compared the rat gulo sequence base for base to the reputed broken version in humans. Although these more recent studies still assume that humans harbor a broken gulo gene that is homologous to the functional gulo gene in rats, they acknowledged substantial genetic differences between the two, just as Nikishimi, Nishikimi showed. The latest studies have revealed that rats have 12 protein coding segments or exons within their GULO gene, whereas humans have only six exons. The other six exons found in rats are completely absent from the human ape GULO pseudogene. Geneticists have concluded that the six exons Absent in humans and apes were lost due to deletion events in an early primate lineage. They were allegedly deleted without a trace, leaving no remnant of the exons behind. An obvious alternative inf interpretation is the exons did not disappear. They were never there to begin with. This makes good sense considering that humans and apes don't generally need to synthesize vitamin C. We've always obtained it from our diet. Well, some of us not so much, and that's why the British uh, used limes in their uh, in in their ships to keep their sailors from developing scurvy. A gulo gene would be convenient, but not necessary in a natural environment where there is abundance of fruit and vegetables. This would mean that the alleged broken vitamin C gene may not be broken at all. Instead, it could very well be an RNA gene with a different function, as is the case with a growing number of pseudogenes, including uh, the, pseudo, uh, the human beta globin pseudogene. A study done in 2003 suggests a serious problem for the broken GULO common ancestry hypothesis. In the Journal of Nutritional Science and Vitaminology, and I and colleagues noticed that numerous nucleotide bases, that is single genetic letter sites, were identical in the broken GULO pseudogene exons of humans and guinea pigs, but were different when compared to the corresponding exons in rats. This did not fit with evolutionary expectations. Apparently numerous mutations seem to be exactly the same in both humans and guinea pigs. Even though rats and guinea pigs are rodents and primates are very distant from rodents, and presumably the ancestor of rodents had a GULO gene. This means that the numerous matching mutations found in both guinea pigs and humans cannot be attributed to common ancestry. Lateral gene transfer, anybody? Um, therefore, it was assumed that the matching altered bases were coincidental, perhaps due to mutational hotspots. So maybe they're not coincidental. Um, they're not random. They tend to mutate at certain spots. But in that case, uh, you'd have to say maybe that was true for humans and uh, chimps. Positions of the genome that are more prone to mutation. To the researchers, this seemed to be the only expl explanation. However, 47 out of the 129 positions were the same in humans and guinea pigs, but different in rats. Statistically, this would never happen by chance. Well, you know, mutational hotspots would work. It is not rational or honest to invoke 47 different mistake, shared mistakes in the GULO gene of guinea pigs and humans. 
It is not honest or consistent to re infer that matching mutations in humans and primates proves common ancestry, while inferring matching mutations in humans and guinea pigs prove mutational hotspots. If the mutational bias argument is acceptable to explain matching mutations in humans and guinea pigs, why isn't it acceptable to explain matching mutations in humans and apes? We suggest that the best solution does not require shared mistakes or mutational hotspots. The most reasonable explanations for why humans, apes, and guinea pigs share so many mistakes, compared to rats, is that their Gula genes were never the same as rat Gula gene to begin with. Their shared mistakes are really shared design. C, shared dispersed repeats, or sometimes known as selfish genes. Until very recently, a powerful argument for human evolution has been based on certain components of the human genome known as dispersed repetitive elements. Dispersed repeats are sequences of DNA that exist in very large copy number and which are scattered all across the genome, like a sentence repeated many times in a book, or like a line of code repeated many times in a computer program. The same basic sentence may be repeated up to a million times within the genome about 50% of the human genome is composed of repetitive elements. Dispersed repeats have been described as junk DNA and has also been called selfish genes. These genetic elements have been seen as clear evidence that humans were the product of an error-prone evolutionary process. It has been further argued that because similar repetitive junk DNA is found within both humans and apes, this proves common descent. This line of reasoning was based on the faulty assumption that these mysterious repetitive elements had no function. New discoveries are showing that these repeating elements have many crucial functions. One of the most powerful examples of a DNA sequence that was presumed to be junk, but is now known to be essential, is the famous ALU sequence. ALU is a type of sign, or short interspersed element. The ALU sequence is only about 300 base pairs long, but is copied, with many variations, a million times in the human genome. All the copies of the ALU sequence account for over 10% of the genome. That's a lot of bases. Recent discoveries now show that these ALUs are not junk, nor are they selfish or parasitic genes. They encode many diverse functions that are vital to life. For example, this very short DNA repeat helps to control RNA processing and alternative splicing. ALUs also help regulate and control transcriptions and polyadenylation, serve as a source for microRNAs, act as microRNA target sites, and can bind the essential co cohesion protein and bind a host of transcription factors. So a lot of things they do. Two of the most recently discovered functions of signs, such as ALU, suggest that ALU elements operate on a very high level of genomic organization. Firstly, it is now known that many signs, similar to but not the same as ALU, can act as binding sites for the CTCF protein in mice. In mice, signs and CTCF cooperate to help establish the dynamic three-dimensional architecture of chromosomes, affecting loop formation, gene positioning, and gene regulation, etc. What is true in my signs is probably also true for human signs, such as ALU. ALU is specific, apparently, to humans. Secondly, it is now known that ALUs are instrumental in what is called A to I editing. A to I editing, meaning adenosine to inosine editing refers to editing of RNAs where the adenosines are modified into inosines. Basically, if my biochemistry is correct, the, the uh, uh, NH3 group that's stuck on the end of the adenine is turned to a C double bond O instead. Or to be precise, the N is turned into an O which changes the way it binds, by the way. It becomes um, somewhat similar to guanine in the, at that point. This editing is selective and developmentally regulated, including that the ALU RNA sequence are acting like a reactive RAM, 
and that information is being modulated through the ALU sequences. This editing is clearly functional and essential. This is evidenced by the fact that when various ADAR enzymes needed for ALU A to I editing are damaged in mice, the consequences range from brain damage to death. There are about 100 million ALU A to I editable, editable sites in the genome of a single human cell. And so just the ALUs in a single cell potentially provide a vast amount of active information. A recent paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences described A to I editing of ALUs. These findings bring to mind information storage models. There, but there is no information. It's just chemistry. As the number of potential editing sites in each ALU containing transcript is high, usually several dozens, the potential for combinatorial encrypted information is enormous. Binary use of A or I in millions of sites in the neural cells, transcriptome, can be considered equivalent of, to the ones and zero, zeros and ones used for information storage and processing by computers. It is tempting to speculate that the more abundant RNA editing found in the human brain may contribute to the more advanced human capabilities such as memory, learning, and cognition. This suggestion is consistent with the hypothesis. Keep in mind, this is not these guys saying it. This is quoting somebody else saying it, who presumably are evolutionary in, in their orientation. This suggestion is consistent with the hypothesis that the advantage of complex organisms lies in the developmental development of a digital programming system based on non-coding RNA signaling. The combinatorial post-transcriptional RNA editing of non-coding sequences may therefore contribute to higher brain function and may play a role in the evolution of human specialization. These discoveries have resulted in radical reversals of our perceptions of the functionality of ALUs. These reversals have happened within the very same labs that formerly distanced, formerly distanced themselves from claiming that any function for ALUs. For example, in 2004, a publication of the Cold Springs Harbor Laboratory said ALU repeats have no known biological function. Boom. But then in 2013, Nine years later, a publication from that very same lab said, based on bioinformatic analyses and deep targeted sequencing, we estimated that there are over 100 million human ALU RNA editing sites locating, located in the majority of human genes. These findings set the stage for exploring how this primate-specific massive diversification of the transcriptome is utilized. Notice they haven't actually proved much, um, but suddenly the attitude has changed. Furthermore, these editable ALUs appear to also be important markers to define the start and endpoints of DNA that are to be transcribed to double-stranded RNAs. Thus, the ALU sequence is not just functional, but is polyfunctional as multiple functions, different functions. These ALU delimited double-stranded RNAs appear to have important regulatory roles which continue to be actively studied. <coughs> Lastly, even though the ALUs of humans and other primates are very similar, the way humans use ALUs is different from than the way other primary uh, primates use ALUs. Humans use approximately twice as many A to I ALU edits as chimpanzees, which means that the way ALUs are actually used by humans and chimps is very different. Sequence similarity does not mean functional equivalence, nor does it prove common ancestry. Compare all these new findings to the traditional dismissal of ALUs as junk, as represented by Francisco Ayala in 2010. Uh, those of you who uh, may remember, Francisco Ayala has argued commonly for um, evolution as the only engine of change. Interestingly, it, he was at one time 
a Catholic priest. I don't know whether he still is or not. Um, there are also lots and lots of DNA sequences that are nonsensical. For example, there are about one million virtually identical ALU sequences that are each 300 letters or nucleotides long and are spread throughout the human genome. Would a function ever be found for these one million nearly identical ALU sequences? It seems most unlikely. Perhaps one could attribute the obnoxious presence of the ALU sequences to degenerative biological processes. That's his comment. Clearly, we are witnessing a series of incredible paradigm shifts. The scientists who are still talking about shared mistakes should think twice before they assume that dispersed repeats are junk DNA. Now, my take on this is Roop and Sanford make an excellent defense of separate ancestry against the charge of inability to explain shared mistakes. Two of the examples they give have been reviewed in this class, beta pseudoglobin, and there's a website for it, and Gulo, which uh, is another website. Um, the various interspersed elements may have some function. They may also be malevolently designed. I don't think we can close that one out. Uh, some of the presentations by Robert Miloshenko may uh, uh, open that question up, I think. Um, but it is important to note that the sting of the evolutionary critique being examined here depends on the shared DNA being useless. If the DNA is useful, then shared DNA can mean shared design quite easily. If the DNA is useless, then shared design is not a good explanation, and suddenly common ancestry is a quite reasonable one. Um, well, except for humans and guinea pigs. Uh, um, that is why ENCODE takes away most of the sting of the argument. If this stuff is all useful, then the argument that it's shared mistakes it's not mistakes and therefore the, the mis that whole argument collapses. Most of our DNA is in fact not useless. Note that the argument depends upon both theology and science. The theological assumption is God wouldn't do junk in two different things. The scientific argument is this is junk. Scientific argument has turned out to be not a very convincing argument. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. Um, can we pass the mic back? So I asked this question before, and you may have answered it, but may have forgotten it. <laughs> but uh, could you, if you know right now, do you, could you give a little summary of the ENCODE, and how, how did they find out what was functional? Well, um, for one thing, they started by saying that if it is transcribed, it's probably functional. I think to be fair, the, uh, the ENCODE actually describes <coughs> in many cases evidence of function rather than proof of function. And you know, if you're a diehard um, a Dan Grauer type of person, uh, you can hold out until the proof of function is there. Uh, I think that the proof of function for the beta pseudoglobin gene is now pretty much there. Nobody really wants to say that beta thalassemia is the normal for humans. Uh, and so uh, if humans were designed without beta thalassemia and the only reason for keeping it around is um, that 
uh, it's useful in warding off malaria, uh, then it can be viewed as a genetic degeneration that has usefulness in certain areas. Uh, and that means that uh, the the argument that this is a mistake collapses because beta pseudoglobin actually does have a function. And, and so, um, <coughs> it, it, and it, the, it needs to be a mistake in order for it to have the theological bite. You see, because if you're doing something and it actually has a function, even if it isn't the traditional function of producing protein, um, and the organism doesn't do as well under most circumstances mm -hmm. without that function, then I think it's arguable that shared design is at least as good an explanation as shared ancestry. Do, do you understand how uh, there can be transcription if there's not initiation sequence? Uh, that is an interesting question. And in the case of beta pseudoglobin, uh, apparently it does transcribe, even though the initiation sequence is pretty well mangled. Wow. Uh, and I'm not sure I c it, That would be um, mm -hmm. a fascinating thing to research. Um, the only thing that I think you'd have to say is, that there is some way of transcribing it, otherwise you wouldn't find uh, the RNA associated with it. We, um, that would be a good research project for somebody, you know, once a master's or PhD, I don't know how much work it would take. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I could imagine something maybe could have a function even, even if it wasn't transcribed. Is that possible to where just the presence of that DNA is influencing something? Well, yes. Yeah. So in, in some cases, the DNA is, is uh, for example, doing a spacing uh, function. Um, and uh, that allows for DNA to loop in particular areas the way, where it needs to. And I think when that happens, you, mm -hmm. again, the experiment would be difficult to do, but I think that you could actually do a, you know, try to snip out all of those pieces and put them back together and then see whether the organism does uh, adequately. Of course, in the mm -hmm. case of humans, that's a little touchy to do that kind of experiment. But, uh, but on, a, on a cellular level, we could do that. Isn't that right? On a cellular level, we might be able to do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess one of the things that is true is that we're having to make judgments without all of the knowledge we need. And I am struck by the analogy of some novice computer programmers looking at some really good code, complex code, and saying, oh, this sequence doesn't need to be there, and cutting it out, and then finding out that most of the time it works just fine, but if you get it into certain circumstances, suddenly a, uh, uh, let's say, a an error detection <laughs> process uh, disappears and you get errors that you're not notified of in the code. Um, and you know, as long as people put things in the right way, it's fine, but, it, but if, if people put uh, 
puts, uh, you know, garbage input, the computer program no longer picks up the garbage input. Um, mm -hmm. And it happens all the time in computer programming, which is why nowadays, if you're a good computer programmer, you not only put your code in, mm -hmm but you put in little comments in there saying, this code does this. Because otherwise people come after you, what is that for? And it's tempting to take it out. Um, but you do so at your own risk. Yes. Uh, over the years, uh, I've heard it argued that um, functional this repetitive DNA uh, must be functional otherwise it would not have maintained its purity and uh, I did not see anything in this section that uh, argued that is is this still a valid argument uh, uh, it's just uh, it seemed to me like it was a fairly good argument uh, I, I just wonder why, why it wasn't mentioned. Well, um, one of the problems that you have is that you have to ask yourself how much time has, it ha has there been for changes to have taken place? And if the argument is that it's thousands of years, then the non-existence of much change is not really much of a surprise. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the argument is that it's had millions of years, mm -hmm. then you really can't account for stuff that has been preserved well without some kind of benefit to the organism. And this is one of the things that deeply disturbs um, people of the Dan Grauer mode. In fact, uh, there's an article written by Dan Grauer and Associates that we went over in class once, um, making this ex argument very explicit that if you have the same s d sequence in mice and humans, then something is wrong if it doesn't have a function. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't have a function that keeps it, the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise, it would have had random mutations, divergences, and you know, uh, you really don't have a good explanation as to why mice and humans would have very, very similar DNA s sequences and something, unless they had a function. Um, and so there are people who will simply say, well, if you have if you have a similar DNA sequence, it mu that's an indication of a function. Interestingly, it was known way back when, when the article came up in Spectrum about beta pseudoglobin, mm -hmm. that human and yeah. chimpanzee yeah. Uh, yeah. DNA for the beta pseudoglobin gene were more similar than they should be if things were mutating randomly, implying either shared uh, design or some kind of function that kept them purer than ordinarily you would expect. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> that evidence completely got missed by the article that uh, Gary, Gilbert. Uh, Gary Gilbert wrote. Um, which I will attribute to his ignorance rather than his uh, malevolence at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, but the people who wrote the article said this thing probably has some function because of that lack of mutations mm -hmm. between chimpanzees and humans. Um, <coughs> and and yet they went on with the argument that it's not functional, mm -hmm. where the papers they were basing it on said it probably is a function. 
there, there is, there is a uh, disconnect between the original articles and the way enthusiasts use those articles, shall we say. And I, I think this is a, a field where, much like what we do with the Bible, we need to go back to the original articles and read them because the, um, the translations are not always trustworthy, shall we say. Yes and no. Uh, I'm impressed uh, with how intricately complex, by complex I mean these things are interrelated. Uh, this picture is becoming here. Uh, it's not just plain ordinary DNA. I mean, you, you're involved in a whole bunch of other things here that we're, and they're discovering. And of course, they're addressing, hey, what is this? They aren't asking the question, hey, how could this come about? And uh, I'm just wondering how long can the scientific community keep playing this game? As long as it has to. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm, I am serious. The point is that the scientific community doesn't view it as a game. They view it as uh, they, you have to have long yes. ages because Lyell proved that. I, I, and therefore, mm -hmm. you have to have some kind of an explanation and they don't really like God getting in there because that means that God <clears throat> caused death and uh, destruction. In fact, that was his way of creating. And so it pushes, once you accept the long ages, it pushes you into an <clears throat> evolutionary mindset, not from scientific arguments, but from theological ones. <clears throat> the God of the Galapagos is not a God worthy to be worshipped. Yeah. And I agree with the guy who wrote that. And that, that means that if you're looking mm -hmm. for something that is theologically coherent, you go with short age. Mm -hmm. I, I am impressed uh, just watching the news the last few weeks and so on about how fluid the human mind is and it just seems to take uh, the shape of the container in which you put it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, uh, the problem I face is that uh, I see something and uh, on the news and I interpret it, hey, uh, this is bad, the other side sees this as very good it's the very same fact. Uh, which, you know, this is a warning to us. Uh, we need to watch uh, carefully and uh, try and keep our, our minds balanced when you're dealing with such strong polarization. Whether this be politically or in the scientific community, uh, uh, there's a lesson to be learned here in what's going on in society. I mean, yeah. I, I've never seen society so so uh, split in my life. Yeah. I mean, and, and, uh, well, I think that the devil is actually trying to destroy the concept of truth because the fuzzier that gets, the more we can decide on the basis of what's good for me instead of what is really there. Yeah. I'll build on that comment. Um, it can all be traced back to the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And once you have that door open, that good can not only be good, but it can be described as evil. Evil can be described as good when you go that route with the tree. I think you have to have a starting point somewhere, and that's the human mind. Um, there was deception in the garden, there's deception today. Um, my comment was that exactly the same as a week ago, that there's more than 
that we do not know when it comes to genetic sequences and mutations than actually what we do know. And I'm wondering, this side of heaven, whether we will know more than what there is to learn with regards to genetics. And probably not. It's, it's a whole, you know, there's a universe packed in with the uh, living cell and a whole universe within DNA and RNA and so on. So I'm, I'm willing to take the humble approach on that. Uh, I'd like to flip the discussion totally around to what we covered in previous times when we looked at the different kinds of homos. And you had uh, Sedaba, and you had Naledi, Naledi, or mm -hmm. I, I call it Naledi, whatever the pronunciation is. Um, I went to some creationist uh, websites, and for example, if you go to uh, Answers in Genesis, they have an Answers Research Journal, and they're very clear that um, Sedaba and Naledi are humans, right? And that's what this uh, book says. Well, the book actually doesn't quite say that. It agrees that Naledi is human. What it says about uh, Sediba is that there are mixtures of humans okay. and apes. It's a mosaic. And in, yeah. and in fact, uh, it, it's, it's an artificial mosaic. Right. Well, the answers in Genesis side I read, and they're saying also there's a mosaic of characteristics. Yeah. When you have eight feet, and a more human body, or vice versa, then there's a problem. <laughs> there's well, a big in, problem. In fact, I think there was one that had a human neck and an ape jaw, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And then an ape that. neck and a human jaw, and you're yeah. going, wait a minute, <laughs> time out. <laughs> so the mosaic hypothesis, well accepted by creationists. What is being debated now, and I didn't realize it, is Naledi, and the debate is whether that is uh, human or not. And um, ICR, Institute of Creation Research, has an online article that just came out, 2018, saying Naledi is, um, is ape, not human. That really shocked me because now we have a, a battle going on among creationists. Oh, you Perhaps. know, it doesn't have to be a battle. And <laughs> I think this is one of yeah. the, I mean, yeah, it can be a battle if that's what you want to do. And if you don't believe that Naledi is human, yeah. then you're a heretic. No, no, uh, no, there, there are no winners or losers. In, when, I, when I use the word battle, uh, differences lead yeah. to a uh, consensus eventually, or should, among right. a, and, a faith and lead group. Right, and lead to research uh, projects uh, you know, uh, the people who do this don't seem to have looked at this as a possibility, uh, as possibly able to get genetic material out of it, but theoretically we should be able to. So and, and that would solve the problem one way or the other. Yeah, that would help if we could. Um, to back up this ICR position, uh, the question is whether <clears throat> the uh, Naledi cave site, and there are more than one cave there, as you know, whether that is intentional burial or just catastrophic, and they, they got lost in the cave and they didn't come out or something like they that. They fell down the cave. Fell down or maybe know, crawled into a black a, hole. <laughs> crawled around a little bit. <laughs> crawled around a bit. There's another article in a professional journal that came out. All of this while we're going through the book, these things are coming out. So uh, nothing, of course, is final. And they're comparing religious burial sites with those that don't seem to have a religious burial or intentional even. And so there's a study of all of the hominids and all of the homos and it's all synthesized with a new database, and their conclusion is Naledi is um, 
not an intentional burial because there are some other random burials similar to that and they can look at probability it's all based on probability yeah. and statistics so just for our information uh, even when they quote scientific papers the papers are dated 2017 and so something in 2018 may change it slightly or significantly that's the progress of science yeah remember it's not whether they got published or not no it is what is the data that they're presenting and what are the arguments that are built on that data and that means you have to really if you're going to critique it you have to understand and if you don't want to understand then you're going to wind up choosing whom you trust it's that simple because if you're not going to do your own work then then you're either going to trust somebody else's work or you're going to uh, or, or you're not going to trust them and the, and uh, the truth of the matter is that what people who make science into a religion want you to do is to worship at the feet of science. And that means worship at the feet of our science because if their science disagrees with us, you, we want you to believe us instead. And the, the proper scientific approach, which has always been said, is go back and look at the experiments and then maybe even do a few yourself. Well, sometimes you can't do the experiments yourself because you're going to have to find your own bones. And at that point, uh, uh, until you find your own bones, uh, you're back to uh, issues of trust. Dare I say faith? Uh, you know, on the comments it says it sounds like faith not science is uh, absolutely true and one of the things that we have to do is we have to get out of the mindset that says well the scientist says that therefore you can trust it the fact of the matter is science is supposed to be built on the institution of distrust skepticism is always considered the default position and uh, if you don't have evidence, then you, you then you have to be skeptical of everything, including even the skeptical position. That means you can't say really anything about anything. Um, and that is a tough position to be in. And the fact of the matter is, these people want you to believe in certain assumed facts. Um, and so what they really want you to do is to have faith in science. Exactly. Which is a little oxymoronic if you think about it. Anyway, come back next week and we will talk about um, the, uh, the human chromosome 2. And uh, for fun, you can read the, the research that has been cited there because I think that uh, it's going to be very interesting.